What is going on, Clippers fans? Welcome to episode 135, the playoff game one preview between the Clippers and the Suns. I am Chuck Mockler, joined by William Updike and Adam Osland. We are Clips and Dip. We are part of the 2 and 3 Hoops Empire. You can find us on Twitter, at Clippers Pod. Find us on YouTube, at Clippers Podcast. Come check us out. Most people loving the videos. One guy, very much not into uh, our videos, but he keeps watching them. So shout out to that. Uh, what an idiot. User. I mean, he's an idiot. Best, uh, best viewer. <laughs> uh, At the yeah, end of the day, we have three microphones and he don't. <laughs> also, catch all three of us on Spectrum One News on Monday after whatever happens uh, for game one. That's going to be a fun time. The Clippers um, infecting Spectrum. I love it. We're invading it. the takeover. It's very real. Today, we're going to be talking. Uh, the starting five matchup in game one, the bench matchup in game one, and then kind of given our predictions as well as one thing we think the Clippers need to do in order to flip home court advantage. We also got, I don't know if update is the right word, but we got some news about Paul George's injury as well as a little bit of clarification on the Marcus Morris thing. Before we get into all of that, we're recording a little er earlier than usual today. How are you guys doing? Adam, how are you on this Kind of gloomy afternoon in Los Angeles, two days before we embark on this playoff journey. I'm good. I woke up today feeling extra positive about the Clippers' chances. No lie. On my way to the gym, I was just like, man, should I go Clippers in four? Should I freak out like that? <laughs> <laughs> but then uh, then I woke up uh, again and uh, realized you woke up I on may the have been dreaming. Of the cryo, of the cryo tank. <laughs> Yeah, what was the last episode of Atlanta? Sensory deprivation tank or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, no, I'm feeling good about this series. I'm excited for it. I'm excited to get things rolling Sunday night. I can't wait to see the matchups, the adjustments, and how we're going to pick it apart right now. Will, are you feeling hyped? Are you as hyped as Adam? Did you wake up feeling incredibly optimistic? I don't know about that, but I, I am feeling good. I You know – I, I don't know if any of you guys have been making the rounds of, of some of the playoff previews from, from mm -hmm. some of the other news outlets. One thing I feel like that has been really cool is that uh, there, there have been some analysts and some people out there, I'm not going to name names, but who have put uh, this matchup, this four or five matchup in one of the more intriguing uh, oh, yeah. playoff matchups for the first round, which I, I, I kind of thought just because of PG's absence, it was going to get kind of completely swept under the rug. Um, so I, I, that's been really cool, you know, still, a lot of people, uh, not really a whole lot of confidence or faith in this Clipper squad, which is fine. That bolsters mine a little bit more. You tell me no, I say yes. You tell me yes, I say no. Uh, so I, in, in that way, in a defiant way, I am feeling a little bit more uh, down with this Clippers thing. And just, yeah, man, the more I think about it, like, just playoff Kawhi, playoff KD. I mean, honestly, either way. We're looking at some very good basketball, but I am. Oh, I don't care I, about the neutral fan. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> I'm still. I, I, I'm feeling. Uh, you know, I'm. I'm. I'm feeling positive on the clips. Uh, we'll talk about this Paul George stuff a little bit later, but um, kind of no news there. But it, I don't know if it's a no news is good news situation. You're down with the clipness, is what is how you feel. Oh, buddy, you've gotten up, up and you are down. down Man, this is the gift that has been given to me. <laughs> All I right. Did I did see, speaking of the optimism, I rechecked the odds earlier today. Nice shirt. I just got the red. I don't got the logo on, but Chuck's styling right now here, after bro. watching us on YouTube. Hope you're in the right uh, neighborhood. <laughs> at Clippers Podcast on YouTube. I checked Bet US or Bet Us, whatever that website is that I checked the first time for the series price, and it was a minus 650. You had to bet 650 to bet a hunt or to win a hundred. Uh, on the Phoenix Suns, so the Clippers were heavy underdogs. It's down to minus 450. So a lot more people have been betting on the Clippers in this series over the last couple of days now. The Sharps, shout out to the Sharps. Uh, they, they keep us alive. Okay, let's get into the starting five talk. Well, I want to talk like projected starting five for the Clippers, projected starting five for the Suns. For the Clippers, I don't think there's going to be any surprises, right? We got Russ, EJ. Kawhi, Nico, and Zoo. I want to stop and give some brief Kawhi propaganda. Uh, there's a great article from Ohm on ESPN today. In each of Kawhi Leonard's nine postseasons, the two-time Finals MVP has averaged more points than he did during the regular season. 
So love to hear stats like that. What did he finish up regular season wise? Was it 24? But that's pretty skewed because early on in the year, obviously he wasn't playing big minutes after he got back to playing 36 a night from January 7th on he averaged 27 points per game. And I think 52% shooting and 47% from the outside after he got back to 36 minutes per game. I do want to caution people though, because I've been talking about this a little bit. Where's the optimism? Where'd the optimism go? I, I just don't think if they're going to win this series, they're going to have to have other guys step up. Like Kawhi could still be amazing, but to shoot much better than he has been over the last three months is a lot to ask, especially from the outside when they're going to be scheming against him, throwing double teams at him. Like What he did in 2021, and granted the Dallas Mavericks – we're not a very good defense. They didn't have as many guys or Kevin Durant that they can put on Kawhi Leonard late in ball games situationally that they could throw at him. And that's why he shot Shaq numbers in that series and because he's amazing and he is Kawhi and he goes playoff Kawhi. But the last three months, he's been so good. The standard is so high. I don't think you can expect him to end up shooting 57% from the field, which is where he ended up after the 2021 playoffs in his 11 games before tearing the ACL. He shot 57% from the field. You can't expect that. Now, Kawhi could still have a very good series and shoot 48% and get 30 per game and shoot 37 or 38% from the outside. You'll sign up for that all day. I just – want to temper expectations on Kawhi's going to shoot 60% from the floor and lead the Clippers to a four game sweep. Like my dream earlier today, that stuff's crazy. Only crazy people think of stuff like that. Like I'm going to be honest. We have nine years of data proving you wrong. Well, points per game going up is one thing, but if, even if you look at uh, his run in 2019, his efficiency went down, I think, in the Eastern Conference Finals and then in the Finals. They won anyways. He was right. still putting up numbers, but the biggest series he had along the way was against Philly, which is crazy because that Philly team was more stacked. They had yeah. Tobias, Jimmy Bigger Butler, bodies. and Ben yeah. Simmons with Embiid on that team. And he's averaged 35 per game and obviously hit one of the most historic series-ending shots we've ever seen. But the efficiency did start to go down. Some of that isn't as important as volume sometimes in the playoffs. We even saw this with Jordan during the second three-peat. The efficiency would go down at times, but as long as the volume is up because the defense is going to be raised in the playoffs, so mm -hmm. it's not as much of an indictment on a player if their efficiency drops down a little bit because guys are given more maximum effort for 48 minutes instead of just the end of games, which is typically what you see in the regular season. Even in some of these play-in games, we've seen much better defensive efforts from teams at times. So just, just the 60%, 50% from the outside shooting, Kawhi, 90% from the free throw line. Maybe you can go 90 from the free throw line. Nobody's guarding. Absolutely. But <laughs> I just – he's been so good the last three months. It – the three-point shooting is not sustainable. 47% from the outside is just not sustainable. But they don't need that necessarily to win in this series also. I'm just saying. All right. He, Adam was very – he built us all up, and then he chopped us down when we were trying to talk about good Kawhi stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the duality of, of Adam Oslin. Okay, so that Clippers starting five, I don't think – there's there. I think there's going to be starting lineup changes if game one goes horribly, but I don't think we're going to see anything crazy to start game one. Right, probably going to be the standard starting five that we've had the last part of the season. Yeah, I don't expect Rocco to be in the starting five in game one. No. Will game two starting Rocco? No. Okay, maybe not. For the Suns projected five, we got CP3, uh, Josh Okoge, Booker, Durant, Aiton. For the Clippers offense, I saw the stat that Lucas Hahn put out. Clippers are 13 and three when they make 16 or more threes this season. So to start this game, I don't know who's going to be, who we're going to try and find to shoot threes. Cause it's not like, you know, maybe it's Nico, maybe it's EJ or something like that. But I would like to see the paint and spray come out 
sprinting in this game one, right? Like we, there's no feel out time for this Clippers team. The Suns are a great team to not feel out against because they're still figuring things out themselves. Um, Will, where are you at on the Clippers offense game one specifically? Because as we know, game two is there's going to be adjustments and all that stuff. What are you looking for from the Clips in game one? Um, honestly, like. We just don't have the firepower to try to keep up with with the Suns offense. Um, the you know, like where we are is is kind of where we're at. And I think that there are things that can be tweaked and adjusted. Um, this is an offense that I I'm thinking the ways that we can punish the Suns is the ways that we haven't traditionally been very good, such as in transition, pushing the pace. Uh, we know what this uh, offense can do in 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 half court sets, so that does you know if, if those things sort of return to what we have seen out of this unit, like out of, out of these units, um, th- that bodes very well for the Clippers. Of course, I mean two years ago, best half half court offense in the NBA. Um, but this isn't the side of the ball that I'm really that worried about for for the Clippers, and I know that that is a little bit think, absurd. Yeah. We, I mean, we have had issues scoring. We do have scoring droughts. Um, you know, certainly the end of the season wasn't necessarily the the best uh, there as far as like team team offense goes. Um, yeah. This isn't the thing that I'm the most concerned about for the Clippers. I, I mean, like if if we're playing a game where like we have to keep pace. That to me is a losing battle for for what Such we are already. I think that makes for, sense. Yeah, for for what we have on the floor and, and who we're going up against and the and the talent disparity without Paul George between these two teams. Well, I think the three point shooting that Chuck brought up, that's one of my biggest points coming into this series. That's paramount for the Clippers because the way to make up for some of that mid range mastery of the Phoenix Suns is to knock down more three-pointers. They have to win the three-point battle. They did during the regular season. Of course, the numbers aren't that true to who this Suns team is now with Kevin Durant, but the Clippers were about half a percent better from the outside over a season that's meaningful, and they took about one more three-pointer per game. Neither of these Remarkably similar, though, numbers. Like, these are both, like, in terms of of attempts – Mid, middle of the NBA, and and yeah, like you said, a percentage point, which does matter, but still, I mean, very close the uh, Clipper, in, in terms of efficiency. Definitely. The Clippers on paper, though, they do have the ability, if they want to take up the option of launching more three-pointers and putting up closer to 40 per game in this series, they have the shooters to do so. They could beat the Suns with the analytics math if they get up a higher volume of three pointers out there people don't realize because that 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 i totally agree but then we get into that thing where it's like no one can hit a shot and then we get into that drought where it's like oh shit i think it just depends on how those shots are looking you know what i mean like if the ball is whipping around and that and that's what's leading to the the higher attempts Keep Absolutely. Yeah. If we're okay. seeing like a no pass dri- like off the dribble uh three point attempt just because the numbers <laughs> right. technically favor it, sure. Um that to me is 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 that's foolhardy. Fair. Yeah. Um and I like three like the the three point shooting I, I think that that's great and then the lo- at getting to the line I think is the other huge advantage that the Clippers Oh, have we're going to talk about that when we talk about the bench cuz we have one guy who's very good at getting those foul calls. Sorry, Adam, continue. Well, What's interesting there is I agree. Those are two areas they have to beat the Suns in. They're also also two contrasting areas. If you're putting up a lot of three-pointers, if you're hitting threes, you shouldn't be getting to the line as much. But I agree. if the majority of your shots, and this is what I go back to the analytics game, if the majority of your shots are threes and layups – those layups can get you to the free throw line. Playing in the paint there can. And I think outside of Kawhi Leonard, everybody else has to just play that analytics game of getting up shots from the outside or shots right at the basket. Kawhi can do the mid-range stuff. Nobody else without Paul George needs to do much of it, and they can be okay. High percentage shots of the basket, and then the three-point shot on the outside is one way to somewhat – even the playing field with how lopsided the talent is at the top with the Phoenix Suns right now. 
So what I do I love you think you... the Clippers can speed things up in the playoffs to, to get to the rim a little bit more to kind of get this Phoenix defense that doesn't have that much continuity uh, scrambling a little bit more? Maybe I we haven't had enough time. I don't. We is that really even the wrong it approach? Yet. I it, it like it. I mean, so I I could be wrong here. Maybe that's maybe that's. I think we got the a wrong slow, approach for this team. I think with these starters, I saw some Kawhi and Zubak pick and roll numbers. Um, Kawhi is the pick and roll ball handler this year. One point one seven points per possession. Zubats as the pick and roll man. One point three points per possession on the pick and roll. So between Kawhi and Russ, this. Pick and roll with Zubats needs to be hitting immediately, and I think they should spam it to start the game. Get eight in motion. You're moving them around. It's shots at the basket. Zoo is a capable free throw shooter. It might look terrifying, but they go in more often than not. So, like, I'm hoping – (laughs) 51%. Yeah. I'm hoping that Russ is disciplined. We've seen – Russ is probably the best passer to Zoo – on the team, we've we've seen him. You know, he he throws the ball where Zoo can catch it, which has been an issue. So, like, if Russ and Zoo and Kawhi and Zoo are on where they usually are with the pick and roll, I really like kind of the start of this game, and I hope they spam that out. In terms of stealing a few points against the Phoenix Suns in the fast break or in transition, I actually think that's really possible for a couple of reasons. The Suns are thirtieth in fast break points on the season. They're only getting 10.5 per game. The Clippers haven't been great in that area, but they've been better since they got Russ. They're at about 13 points in transition a game. And they've had a couple of quarters. They've had a couple of quarters the last 10 games. Well, they've done that in a quarter. They've gotten more than 13 points in transition. Because if you miss, here's the downside to running up and down. But I think it's not as severe or as drastic of a downside against the Phoenix Suns. Normally you miss a layup in transition. If Russ is going, you know, Tasmanian devil at the basket and you miss a layup, it's a fast break going the other way, but Phoenix doesn't want to play that way as much. So it doesn't hurt you as much. If you end up missing that layup by pushing the issue a little bit with getting downhill and trying to get quick buckets that way. I think the Clippers can pick their spots, be selective and find ways to get a few extra points than Phoenix in transition in the series. That's a good call. Um, there's so many. I'm so excited for this game one. I'm so nervous, but like I just because I want the Clippers to come out just as like a flaming ball of rage and try and just extinguish the Suns early. All right, let's look at the other side of the ball. Small ball versus DeAndre Ayton. Ty Lue was asked about this today in practice. Ty Lu said this on the problem Aiton creates versus small ball. He said, I mean, we've got to see it. He did it two years ago, but let's see if he can do it again. He, he has the capability of doing it, but we just can't go into it being scared because of offensive rebounds and not trying what's best for us. So we are going to see some small ball in game one, it feels like. But defensively, it seems like Ty Lu is just going to be like, let's try it out and see what happens. Like we're kind of in this like, throwing stuff at the wall again and seeing if it well, works, which I'm a little fine with because that's what we have to do. But I interpret it more as a big hinge for game one is all I'm saying specifically to this first game. I see it more as make DeAndre Ayton prove it, that he can punish Absolutely. our small ball before we give up on it. You oh, know? I totally agree. But And they should do that. I agree. But where I get a little worried is how long is that prove it leash? Like how long – Will DeAndre Ayton have to prove it before we pull the plug? Well, you know yeah, what I'm I, sure. And and during the regular season, they've tried things and they've thrown stuff against the wall repeatedly, and it hasn't worked. And most people first guessed a lot of it. I think there's obviously going to be a shorter lease on any experiment like this in the postseason. You just can't afford totally. to let a team go on a quick 25 run on you. But even if <laughs> all, yeah. he's getting offensive rebounds, even if he's getting putbacks on you, even if he's bullying you, DeAndre Ayton, because he has the size and you're just down a big body out there because you're going small – He's not getting three-pointers on you. And on the other side, the Clippers are going to be able to spread them out. So it could be a situation where, yeah, you're giving up points, but you're still getting more on the other end by going small. Okay. I think that's an excellent point, too, because you're kind of going to have to pick your poison with this Phoenix team 
Yeah. And there's I three think, poisons. I say there's three and a half poisons. Well, I, I yeah. I mean, yeah, two, two to three and a half, two and a half to three and a half. I think there's definitely um, three. You got eight and book KD, and then the half is Chris Paul. Do you guys agree with a lot of people saying the Suns have four of the best five players in this series? No. I don't know about that. I think they have three. So so who are the five best players? <laughs> uh Kawhi. Uh, so I mean let's just name the Clippers ones, right? Like it's Kawhi and I think it's and this is really only if you've watched the team a lot. I think it's Zoo. I think but, it's Kawhi Zoo and then so I think Zoo's it's better obvious. than Aiden. Well, I just think they're in that five best players list, right? But so no. like, I think it's Kawhi, Zoo, and then obviously KD, Book, eight. Those are the five best players in this series. I can't rank them. I mean, Kawhi's number one, then probably KD. Well, that's kind of the question, though. People are saying the Suns have the top four there, or four of the top five. Oh, damn. Maybe. Because you could go, even if you I'm say no, Kawhi is the I best think... player, then it's mm. KD, then it's Booker, then they're saying it's CP3. Than DeAndre Ayton. Is there anybody better than DeAndre Ayton and CP3 or somebody that could rise up for the Clippers and prove to be a better player than one of those two guys? Because that could be that could be the difference within in the, the series. Within the series, it has to be one of our bench guys, I think. Or Russ, based on how this team is now constructed. I I mean, like, look, I CP3, you know, great legacy all aside, but <laughs> Close personal friend of William. <laughs> Close personal friend, of course. Uh, are you telling me that the gap between CP3 and... I'm saying Zoo. Norm uh, and, and like Norm or even Russ or Eric Gordon is is that large at this point I think in their careers? I think it's higher than... I think it's higher for Russ. I think, again, within the context of this series... I think it's higher than Russ. I think it's arguable for Zoo. And Norm, I think a lot of it depends on how the refs are feeling that night for Norm. Because CP3 is always going to get the call. But Norm. Not if Scott um, Foster's there. Yeah, what's it? Oh, man. What's he? Should we, do you think Scott Foster would come on the show? Could he actually be the fifth guy that takes over his spot? I'm kidding. <laughs> you're gonna get a you're gonna get a Clippers Foster jersey if that happens. <laughs> um, well, one of the other big questions is: Do the Clippers guard KD one on one and have him just do it all like we've seen with the Luca thing, or is that not even possible? Um, a, another great stat from the Ohm article on ESPN. Everyone go read it. Kawhi has defended KD. For 626 half court matchups in the regular season and playoffs over the past 10 seasons, only PJ Tucker and Trevor Ariza have defended Durant more individually during that stretch over the past 10 years. There's only two guys who've defended KD one on one more than Kawhi Leonard. But if KD is going to, I mean, KD, he's he's very difficult. To, he's he's not stoppable. He's an unstoppable force. Do we? Put Kawhi on book and just say, hey, you know, Nico, go on, be on KD, do your best. He's going to get his. It's whatever. But if Kawhi's on book, makes it harder for You know what I mean? Like, this is where it gets tough in this game one because there's not really room for error when it comes to this decision particularly. If Kawhi's on Booker, who's on a Kogi in the starting five? Gordon? Okay. Or Russ, and, and you put and Gordon he, on CP3? I'm just thinking whoever that guy is on Oko, Okogi could shade, could show, could help defensively. He hits threes. And the other thing about Okogi. He shoots 33% from three on the season. Uh, Okogi, though, he – this other weird thing. Shane Young, uh, big Suns fan, but he covers the Clippers, uh, posted a stat. Okogi has, like, one of the highest – Offensive rebounding percentages for someone under six four, like ever. <laughs> like, so I think you got a second hit, but like Shane Young posted some stat about a Kogi with KD in the lineup hitting more threes. He's just gonna have chances, but like, so that's that's the issue, right? Like, do we put a bad defender on a, a bad defender on a Kogi? Like, where does I think KD if you, go? I, 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 I think it's I think as long me, as where does Kawhi go? I guess. I, 
I think as long as you're uh, like avoiding like easy backdoor cuts or something like that from Makogi, I, I think that, yeah, maybe you just kind of plant somebody out there. You give them a little bit of space, enough that you can. It just like depends on how. On, yeah, yeah, it just depends on how bad you get hurt on that closeout, right? Like if he's knocking down threes, then I guess you have a little less. You, you you know you have to give him a little bit more gravity. But like if there's only a couple of shots that you can see on the floor, it's probably uh, DeAndre Ayton shot ten feet or more out from the basket, which he will take. You know, in that yeah. little in in that little range, that pocket, like a, you know, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and a Kogi, I think it, as long as it's not, you know, like a, a it, you're not conceding a cut to the rim. I mean, like those are shots that you're pretty comfortable with on the floor. Yeah. And the other thing that's weird too, is like, it's not like KD is an elite passer, right? So there is an argument for double KD. What the fuck's he going to do? <laughs> right? <laughs> like he's a good passer. I'm not saying that, but it's not as much of a threat as like doubling a Luca. I don't think that will work that well, honestly. That's KD, fair. KD is so tall. He's just, what's he going to do? Totally. He's going to no, look over the not, top of yeah. both guys and find the open player. man. Yeah, like, He was a pretty good passer with the Golden State Warriors playing within that offense that way. But it's just not something that's required time. of him as yeah. much. Sure. But with his size, it's just a hard guy to trap. <laughs> he can yeah, still look true. over the top of you. <laughs> yeah. So who are we – who do you – Adam, who do you want to see guard KD to start? Because there's going to be multiple looks. We know that. If we're talking starters, who Batum. do you want to see on KD? Batum. Batum's got to be like on that. him. This is why I if we that. were right and you brought it up first, a flaming ball chuck, <laughs> you brought it up first. <laughs> That's his new name tag if you're watching us I on guess. YouTube. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you want to watch us on YouTube and see Will uh, just being a maestro, on the name tags, check us out at Clippers Podcast. It's a fun time. It really enhances the experience of this show. It's like a different layer. It's just all the, all the sub. You get all the key talking points if you're if you're too busy to listen. You yeah. can glance up at the screen. You you basically know what's going on. There's inside jokes running between us while someone else is talking. It's amazing, but uh, <laughs> Nicholas Batum, you said a couple months ago, Chuck, you thought they were. They had him on a soft minutes limit, and that's why – I mean, there was a game against the Milwaukee Bucks. There was no talk of him being injured at home, and then all of a sudden he didn't play in that game, and I think they said it was back spasms or something like that. His minutes have been reduced, and I think the reason is to get the most out of him because he's likely going to be playing 38, 40 minutes a night in the playoffs because he's just a multi-tool Swiss Army knife. Draymond Green of the Clippers type player. He can do so much for them. Um, so I, I'm hoping this is it. This is that moment. And we'll see the best version of Nick Batum that we've seen all season long uh, defensively. And he can do the best he can harassing Kevin Durant. Because with Luka, it was you can't let him do both. You can't let him score on you and be a playmaker. And the, the Clippers would typically take away just the playmaking side. Now, early on in that series – they were shooting the role players for the Dallas Mavericks in 2021 were just absurd from the outside. Dorian Finney-Smith, Tim Hardaway Jr. Those guys were shooting 60% from three to start that off that series. Insane. Yeah. And Ty Lue was kind of like, we expect a lot of averages to come into play. And eventually they did. But that is something I worry about. I mentioned a Kogi's only shooting 33% from three on the season. But we talk about role players and backups and lesser players and contributors and ancillary characters on this Clippers team stepping up. The same can be said. The Phoenix Suns could also have that same mentality where someone's going to help us win a game when Kevin Durant is off. And maybe a Kogi hits five three-pointers because you leave him open and dare Which I him think to shoot. That will happen at some point, I think. And that's going to be a really difficult game for the Clippers to win when it's not Agreed. just their big four – but somebody else like the Cameron Payne game in game two of the 2021 playoffs happens. Mm -hmm. Now there was no CP three. So he was kind of making up for lost production there. But if any of their role players are able to elevate their game, because a guy like a Kogi has played two minutes total in the playoffs. Right. We talked about coming into the series. Some guys have a clean slate. They can make up for a bad season 
or maybe they feel more pressure to perform because they've had such a good season, but now it's the playoffs and that can wreck them. You don't know how some of these young guys are going to perform. Okogi could be a killer all of a sudden. You worry about that. Torrey Craig could step up. Terrence Ross, who's been a Clipper killer in the past, could have a game. Like They can't afford to have one of these other guys go off too and, and carry the Suns for a quarter, you know. The, the, the margin for error is just too small in this series for that to happen. The Clippers need it to happen on their side. They need to hope that it doesn't happen for the Phoenix Suns. Yes, that is – that is yeah. And we're going to talk bench talk in a sec. Um, do we have any notes on who we want on CP3? We've talked – obviously, Aiton, Zoo. <laughs> I want to see what Russ can do, honestly. I think yeah. that would be interesting. Because if Russ is guarding him and CP3 is guarding Russ – I'm hoping Russ is going to get him, back him down in the post and be physical on the offensive side and wear CP3's ass out. I think that's one of the biggest keys to this series. If Russ can make Chris Paul work, and it doesn't mean Russ has to force it offensively with his own shots just because he's the bigger, stronger guy. If he gets them in a disadvantage, he can then find a cutter or somebody roll into the basket for an easy one, which he has done as a clipper a lot. He doesn't have to necessarily take the shot, but if he can just cripple their defense by making a guy have to come over because CP3 is too small against him, that could be big for a kick out and a swing. And on the boards too. De like defensively, and, and maybe I'm a fool here, but whoever <laughs> is on ball, I like – I'm pretty comfortable with having Russ defend like it at, like at the point of attack on ball. I I'm not saying that he's the best defender, but I, I'm but you're not depending on cringing, depending out. on how you space stuff out around him. Like that's an area where he's pretty good. Right. Uh, and yeah, he, you know, he might get blown by sometimes he'll, he might have to get helped out by other guys, but I don't, but that's think how it goes. He, yeah. Like that's, that's playoff basketball. He's just, he, he's big enough and athletic enough that I think, you know, like in a, in, in a scenario like that, um, I don't think that that's, I, 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 like, I don't think that that's still an easy bucket. Like, I don't think that that's a gimme for, for the Suns. I agree because over the last year, if you looked at the numbers when he got moved over to the Clippers after the trade from the Lakers to Utah and the Clippers brought him in, everybody was saying actually on ball, he's been very good. His post defense is good. And when a guy is in front of him, point of attack has been much better this season. The Lakers fans His were biggest problem that, is that he's a ball watcher, right? Yeah, so like that, exactly. so it's an the, attention the span thing. That I'm worried about. <laughs> it's an attention span thing. I heard that in school a couple of times. Uh, back <laughs> the um, this is – I'm so excited for this first round matchup. All right, we're going to talk the bench in just a bit. We got ads coming up. <laughs> Will apparently believes in Russ's D, according to himself. Uh, we got Get this ads shit off my screen. <laughs> <laughs> We you said ads. it, brother. We got, <laughs> <laughs> we got, you guys got to watch the YouTube. Uh, we got ads coming up. If they've been too loud for you, turn it down. Um, then we're going to talk some bench talk. We got ads coming up. Go ahead and turn it down. Uh, ads in three, two, one. All right. So we talked a little bit about the top end talent in this series. It's pretty clear. Phoenix Suns have an advantage there. Now, I think a big question for this Clippers team will be, can they get the relief that they need in some of these other minutes, right? The Suns will be able to stagger effectively, but I think, in my opinion, I, correct me if I'm wrong here, I think the bench advantage for the Clippers is indisputable. The depth advantage for the oh, Clippers yeah. is indisputable. We don't have the top-tier talent, but I think that the 8-10 to 10 man rotation that we have is stronger. Yes, and Law Murray... Shout out Law Murray. Also, if you're not reading Law Murray stuff, phenomenal LA Clippers beat reporter. Then you've broken he the law. Go to jail. <laughs> there you go. I am the law. Don't read law? <laughs> jail. Uh, law Murray said, basically, Norm Powell is the only Clippers reserve that seems to have an ironclad role. They need him to be a dark artist foul merchant. He is. Everyone else's usage. He would expect a flux oh, rate, especially gorgeous. after game one. Which I agree. I think we're going to see a bunch of Norm. He also said Mason Plumlee is going to be needed when Clippers need to keep a center in, which we got to watch Zoo's fouls. If Zoo gets switched on to KD, I'm a little worried about that foul situation. Terrence Mann's going to get his time. But after that, he doesn't really know. Um, <laughs> so it's a, like we need Norm. Norm is the best bench player in the series by far. 
Um, Adam, how far do you think the Clippers bench rotation goes in game one? Like, so we got the starting five, then we got Norm, I, Terrence, Mason, Roko. Does Morris get in? Are we seeing 10 guys? Like, I, I've already said I believe Roko's playing in one of the first two games, maybe both, if it's successful, and he uses him in game one. I think it's happening. Roko was told, you know, at the end of the season, stay ready, be ready. Uh, may, maybe they're going to – Clear your calendar in six months, buddy, because we're really going to need you. But until then, do your thing. What if it was the ace in the hole all season long it that Coach no, Lou didn't no, want to a, show he on he's tape? Not playing. It's not an ace in the hole. Oh, my God. Okay. I can't. I, we'll talk about it that. It is because you can't see the ace and you can't see Rocco Dude, out on the you, court during the regular can't season. not play somebody. You can't not play somebody. I think they know what they have with Rocco. I think they There's know how difference. to use him. I, I'm not saying they don't know how to use him. They just didn't play him. How will they use him though? Like, are are like? Hey, great question. Thank you are, for getting are, us back on track. <laughs> are are we gonna see? Are are we gonna see five out? Um, in, I think we in are. Non eight in minutes. Or are we gonna see that against Chuck Landale? Uh, what I mean, I, I know that we talked about this a little bit on the last episode, but I'm still just like from from the sample size of the regular season, which to be fair is 82 games. Uh, <laughs> didn't really. Didn't really I, inspire I just didn't get, you to feel comfortable about it. I didn't get a strong indication of how they intend to use Robert Covington in any sort of meaningful way. I think in this Thank series, you. because Phoenix now has KD, it will force them to have to use Rocco at times, regardless of how much they want to, to either rest Batum or rest Kawhi. I think they have to have that other wing, especially because no Paul George right now, too. I think right. Rocco. Has got to get some minutes out there. It just totally makes agree. sense with Kevin Durant now on the Phoenix Suns. So you think game one we see some Rocco? I think it's you know fifty one percent chance. <laughs> um, so who? So behind Norm, which as Law Murray put so eloquently, the dark artist foul merchant that he is, gorgeous, phenomenal, gorgeous writing. phenomenal prose from Law Murray mm-hmm. there. Who's the second most important bench player for the Clippers in this game one? I'm going to go. I Yeah, it has to be Terrence Mann. We need him 100%. on the boards. Him and Russ, when they share the floor, that's going to be hell for who for the guards, for whoever Phoenix puts out in terms of the activity phase, right? Like those are two guards are going to be charged up. And also, they're, are we going to see a Bones in game one? Or are we waiting to unleash Bones in game two? Like – Look, the way that Kawhi has looked with that, with, with some of those bench lineups, I don't know why you wouldn't go to it. Yeah. I, I mean, I really. I, it's not like we have a sample size of the season. Like, I don't know what, if, if we need to stick something at the wall. Because the Suns bench is campaign, Torrey Craig, Jock Lawndale, Damian Lee, Terrence Ross. Where do we think that cuts off? Because they're still feeling stuff out too. Maybe they're at an extended bench. Maybe it's like a 9-10 guy thing. Here's the problem. As much as the Clippers have a bench advantage, we're not doing five-man line shifts out there. The Suns are going to, to be keep... fair, we might. If it's going real <laughs> shitty, we might. Okay, but the Suns... <laughs> no, Kawhi will still be out there. Yeah, yeah, true. The Suns won't. They'll at least have one of their big four out there and likely two. So that kind of mitigates some of the issues they have with their lack of depth and quality guys coming off the bench when you're always going to have some combination of Paul George, KD, Booker, and DeAndre Ayton out there. If you just have two of Chris those Paul. guys. Sorry. Or CP3. Paul, I'll tell you what. If Paul George plays from the Suns this series, I will be furious. It's over. <laughs> Fellas, it's over. Look. Paul that, George, Paul's that on be, that, that. That purple and orange, ooh, it's, it's over for the Fellas, Clippers. we're done. We're done. <laughs> But two of those four guys likely out there for the Phoenix Suns. So I don't think we can – I think some people maybe have been overstating just how much better the bench is for the Clippers. The problem is the Suns don't have just two really good guys. They don't have just three. They have four. We're never playing a full bench lineup. That's just never going to happen against the Suns. Terrence Mann, though, to me – Aside from Norman Powell and the three-point shooting for the Clippers, I think they need, and this may be asking a lot, but I think he's capable, him to average around 15 per game. Because what that does is it's even less about him being a scorer. To me, it's 
if he is scoring, Coach Lou can't take him out because Great I call. think Great his call. reservations about Terrence are what he provides to them offensively sometimes, especially in the half court. Yeah, they don't trust his offense. Ty Lue likes guys who create offense. That's why Marcus Morris was in the lineup for so long. It's why Terrence would not get runs unless he was, as you said, like hitting consistently. Yeah, he his offense – Weirdly, is going to keep him on the court for this Clippers team because the defense. What if he just killed. plays the DNR game? Deflections, rebounds, two things we know Terrence can do. Two things that if this team opts to go small, I think could be massive, like on 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 both ends of the floor. Yeah, I just I don't think that he needs to score. I understand what you're saying from like the Ty, from Ty Lue's perspective and right. sort of like the, the you know what we see him focus or or put emphasis on. I just think that. There's so many ways that he can he can impact the game non-scoring wise that I mean I know he's not going to be in the starting lineup but I I do think is not in game one, one of, but is, is one of the best compliments around our other pieces and I mean not to put too much out there but like I, I mean outside of Kawhi is the most crucial player maybe in this series to me well because so for me it's for like if I if I'm thinking about like defenders right like. Batum and Kawhi are probably the most versatile defenders for the Clippers. I'd maybe put Zoo up there just because he's asked to do some insane things. I don't know if he's capable. I, he's I mean, he can do a lot, man. We but talked would... about we talked about this a bunch, like how I, my I don't get the full body clenches the way that I used to when Zoo is on an island. Now I, yeah. I mean, like because you're like fine, hit the step back three, whatever. Um, but then I would put Terrence on that second tier. Of, he's been asked to guard one through second five tier. Sometimes. Of, the, <laughs> of he's below Kawhi and Batum is what I would say. Um, so I think I re, I'm really hoping that that uh, that Ty Lue can see that and just <laughs> thank you for spelling Terrence right at least. Um, but yeah, I, and then there's the Marcus Morris thing. So Marcus Morris was asked today by Joey Lynn, a Clippers reporter. Uh, Joey said, you said that everybody outside of PG is feeling good, so that means you do expect Marcus to be back and available for the first round. Ty Lue said, yes, sir. <laughs> Joey said, do you kind of see a role for him without giving too much away with your rotation? Do you see a role for him in the rotation this series? Ty said, yes, sir. Ty is very coy. We all know that. Um, I'm hiding my reaction to this. <laughs> <laughs> Objection! Leading the witness. Do Look we think Bir yeah. believes in Russ? Do we think that Marcus comes in in Game Here. One? I'm fully prepared for Marcus Morris to come in after Game One. Do we? No, think, I, I think I think, think he think makes an game appearance one? in Game One. Who's yeah. he guarding? Because that's all I care about. Who's he guarding? Jock Landale. That seems bad because Jock Landale <laughs> kills us. <laughs> Regular season. He's a, he's a big body though. He is a big body. Um, I don't think we see Marcus in game one. That's my guess. Below 51%. Wow. Damn. Okay. That's, that's a I, bad I odds think, from the Oslin betting book over there. <laughs> I think he he is uh, an adjustment during the series piece if they, if they need him. Uh, and I don't think game one coming in is going to be that. I, I could totally be wrong, uh, but – I just feel like, you know, so much stuff is scripted going into that first game. It's like that first drive in the NFL. Scripted you know, drives. You're yeah, you're scripted. Teams look sure. better. Then you get punched in the mouth, see what you're made of, and have to adjust on the fly. And I, I, I just feel like they have probably so many um, fallback plans in game one before they get to Marcus Morris. But I could be wrong. Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> who, who are we most worried about on the Suns bench? Between campaign, Tory Craig, Jock Londale, Damian Lee, um, Terrence Ross. Jock Londale also for his career averaging ten and seven versus the Clippers. I think Tory Craig. I actually I, worry about him being in the starting lineup midway point of this ooh. series. He's he's a better, more physical guy to put up against Kawhi, and he's a better three point shooter than. Uh, a Koji. Yeah, who's going to guard Kawhi? I know we were supposed to talk about the bench this second, but like, who's guarding Kawhi? Are they going to put Durant gonna, on? I, not to start. It's going to be a Kogi's going to guard him to start. I, I'm fine that, with that. That's I'm the guy who's been on him during the season. I yeah. think in key moments, he's a good defender. I'm not trying to shit talk a Kogi, but I'm he is, but he's smaller. 
than yeah. than than Craig. Uh, and I think Kevin Durant in key spots will be on Kawhi, which is something I worry about. Kevin Durant is a great defender. His size alone is just terrifying out there. And when he focuses in on that end, I remember – during his first season with the Golden State Warriors, people were saying, I don't know how many votes he got, but I think he got votes for Defensive Player of the Year. Oh, wow. That's funny. I did not know that. <laughs> um, yeah, the bench. No, the are, are we discounting yeah. Terrence Ross in this too? No. So that's – I I for game one, I didn't know who to put for the Suns bench talk. But I think Terrence Ross no, is another fair. person who, like, we got to be careful of. <laughs> I mean – with Tory Craig, Jock Landale, and Terrence Ross, I mean, the like the size there of the bench is definitely a little bit more intimidating. Even when I talk about you know the Clippers, I think having the the overall um, win in the in, in the talent side there, um, that's that's difficult. And then that's there's difficult. and then there's campaign mm. who streaky, you know. A, a, bit of up and down i don't know it's there's a lot of question marks on the sun's bench compared to the clippers bench i heard from robert flom on one of the recent uh the lob the jam the podcasts shout out 213 empire mm -hmm. and big shot bob flom in particular make yeah. the comparison between campaign and bones highland bones Ooh. does have some of that campaign really game about bones yet. Yeah. with the way he speeds by guys and turns the corner and tries those underhand layups, it does look a little bit like campaign when he's at his best. And he hasn't been as good as he was a couple of years ago, but he's still only 28 years of age. I think his best game or most critical game was still the one against the Clippers yeah. at game two okay. without Chris Paul. So he may have some confidence going back up against them. I don't know, but he hasn't been as When you want to talk about a guy who like could turn it around in the playoffs, I mean, I would firmly put campaign in, in that camp. Yeah, he's also though a weakness on the defensive end. Like he's somebody oh, yeah. that they can pick on on that end. There are holes because of the guys they had to give up in the trade with the Phoenix Suns, and you just have to exploit them every chance you get. You talked about spamming stuff earlier. Anything that works out there for the Clippers, just bludgeon them to death with that strategy <laughs> until they find next. a way to yeah. stop it. <laughs> so we haven't talked about Bones yet which I think he's going to have a bigger role later in the series, not game one. Or, I mean, so maybe am, we, like, am we I, need am I, happen, like, but... am I crazy here? Like just from the sample size of what we've seen from Terrence and Bones together, has that not been enough? Has, has that not proved enough? In, for me yes, or for Coach Tyler? It, it, like in that, <laughs> I mean, has, has that not proved enough to at least merit a look? I guess, you know, depending on how Phoenix staggers their stars, for sure. I think T-Bones But you're telling me a... we're not, we're, we're not going to throw that out there? Something like – Game one would specifically? A, it, it, it would just be another – like, but why would you not try something that has worked? Why would you play Moses Brown so much? You know, like they're like I agree with. I know, what you're but saying. that's not the playoffs. I agree with what you're saying, but Ty Lue, like I just don't know. I don't know if Ty Lue. Adam, where are you at on this? Like this is something that's been effective. Those guys yeah. plus Kawhi. Uh, like I, I. You put Batum and Zoo out there next to him. That's a great line. Would, would you expect to not to to not see Bones just given what we've seen since the trade deadline? I mean, if you're going off the regular season, and the Olive Garden, as you call it, <laughs> that the Clippers became <laughs> after oh, Wingstop. <laughs> that Ty has an affinity for guards, and there may be a better chance that Bones gets out there before Robert Covington does, especially if someone's struggling. What if Eric Gordon or Terrence Mann is struggling out there? You mentioned Bones playing next to Mann, but him just next to Kawhi has been good too. Uh, if somebody else – is struggling, I think there's going to be a short leash. Norman Powell is one who I think you just have to ride with for the most part. If Norm has a bad series, I don't think they can win. Like they they have to have Norm, I think, get an efficient yeah. 20 in this series. And his abilities and skill set out there and the way he was playing coming into the playoffs, coming off the shoulder injury, he looks ripe for having a big, a big right. series. They need him. <laughs> right yeah. for the picking. I saw. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think yeah. he brought his dancing shoes to Phoenix. He's gonna be waltzing in twenty. <laughs> God, I hope so. That'd be phenomenal. Um, yeah, this first game, 
man, it's, it's going to be interesting what Ty Lue picks up in this first game and then carries over the second. Um, anything else on this bench kind of talk we've had before we get into this this PG update and some predictions for game one? So, like, if Robert Cummington, not if, I, I do think that he will see the floor. I, I'm still, like, it's still a huge question mark for me. Where? Phoenix. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Is it the footprint center? What is it called now? I think it's like the footprint. It's something. It's a terrible name. Um, no, Will, that's a good point. Like, yeah. does he like? Does he? Is come he a last ditch towards thing? the end like... of Kawhi's shift, and then he's on the floor until Kawhi? Like, I, what if he just comes I, in I, for really, Zoom? I, I'm, I'm like a, a, a really a little bit confused as to where okay he's gonna fit in. Well, let's try. Uh a first quarter simulation and say Kawhi plays the entire first quarter, which you will, I'm which you will, and is not going to come out or is going to come out of the game and not play the first three minutes of the second quarter. Who's the lineup out there for both teams. You think, because what I've been hearing is the Phoenix suns typically let Booker go the whole first quarter, but they pull CP three and Kevin Durant earlier in the first to give him a little bit of rest to start the second quarter. So in that case, if KD starting the second quarter and then Batum also plays the and entire not first start the second quarter, if he plays the whole first, right? So if Kevin Durant starting the second quarter and Kawhi isn't, and either you only have Batum out there or you don't Rocco has to be out there. Totally. agree. Yeah. We need at least yeah. one defensive wing out there. Um, the, the simulation stands. <laughs> <laughs> You're like the architect from the Matrix. Um, <laughs> no, I think yeah, the minutes distribution is going to be really, really interesting. Because if that's the case, I don't want Kawhi on the floor. Well, we were just talking about it, right? Like Kawhi's not going to be on KD the whole time, but I still don't want. Kawhi off the floor if Katie's on the floor. But just you know what I'm saying. What about you? If keep that's the Kawhi... adjustment, though, I mean, Ty Lue will, will then adjust around that. Like we won't see Kawhi yeah. Very in call. like the you know the the usual the book ended first yeah. and fourth with stints in. in what in about the this? Quarters. Kawhi we're, plays we're... the whole first, the whole second. You get a break in half, whole third, whole fourth. I think he might be onto something there. How many minutes is that? Uh, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> the other thing we're forgetting. Over 20. <laughs> we're, we're, we're overlooking Devin Booker a little bit too here. Sure. Like the other reason Roko could be needed is just because I'm stressed thinking about there's it. also Devin Booker. Yeah. Like Terrence Mann could guard Devin Booker. Eric Gordon could guard Devin Booker. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not see Norman Powell on Devin Booker. We can't see Bones Highland on Devin Booker. How many I think guys... Russ could soak up some minutes there. Russ could guard some Devin Booker, definitely. Yeah. And that's um, what I'm saying, too. Like, bring in Terrence and Bones. If Kawhi is going to play that full first stretch, you know, sort of get them going, be the like be the pillar for that. Um, and then, you know, you have... Where's Norm, a, though? You, you have another guard who's... Uh, who, you know, like I said, in certain scenarios, I, I don't think is as big of a negative as as some of the other options at guard. Yeah, I mean, we're getting too far out into the weeds a little bit, but <laughs> I, I'm thinking like, okay, if those I've two got start, your waiters on out there, <laughs> if those two start the second, T Bones with Terrence Man and Bones Highland, Norm can't start the second. Then probably you can't pro you probably can't run all three of them, even though we've seen it. I guess but Phoenix. Will he, that, so there's this variable that we're not accounting for is all this stuff that we've seen even during the regular season. Like, could you do those three? Could, like, could you Ty do will. those three though with Batum Roko and Zoo? And Zoo? Is, that, is that crazy? <laughs> crazy uh, son of a overload. I don't In know. game Ter one, that's the thing we're Ter talking game Terrence one. Bone, uh, yeah, Terrence Bones, Powell. Let's call it Rocco and Zoo. That's a lot of defensive responsibility for Zoo in that particular lineup because Rocco hasn't been super good one on one, and there there's a lot of switches for Phoenix to go after. I think with that three guard lineup. 
Yeah. It's going to be madness. <laughs> but maybe in those minutes, like you just make KD the priority or like even, you know. We're saying like, Booker's not starting the second because he's playing the whole first, which is how things have been going. That's what I'm saying, right? Like, assume, like, let's assume that their first off stint, it's Kawhi and Booker both on the bench, right? Mm -hmm. So your your primary scoring options are Kevin Between Durant, Roko, Zoo, CP3. And man, do you have enough coverage on Kevin Durant? And you can hope to do enough on Chris Paul to at least tread water, right? Like, I, you know, these aren't going to be like I, I'm not expecting like knockout minutes, or we're going to find something that's like, oh, this is. Uh, you know, this is even a, a plus five lineup. Like this is something that can tread water in the time while Kawhi is not there and Kevin Durant is on the floor. That's all that I'm saying. I yeah. think our hypothetical hippo is getting too big. And, uh, <laughs> you guys need to wait for some adjustments to be made. Is what you need to wait for. Yeah, we're just overthinking everything. Paralysis by analysis now. Ah, that, let Coach Lou figure it out. But I will say this to your point of what we see in the regular season how much of that is going to translate into the playoffs? I, I think I have a ton of confidence in Coach Lou still, even by just the last couple of weeks, that the three guard lineups, certainly the four guard lineups, we're not going to see much at all. This is his happy place, getting into a seven game series and making adjustments and playing 3D chess while, you know, being in the weird Batman or bat position hanging upside down. I, this is, this is what Coach Lou wants. So I think he's going to be ready for every scenario that's out there. And I don't think we're going to see a lot of the stuff we saw in the regular season. I don't. God, I hope so. <laughs> like, I really hope we don't see that stuff in the regular season. Um, I'm so excited and so nervous uh, for this particular basketball game. But we got to talk Paul George. We got a quasi update uh, that's coming up in just a couple of seconds. If the ads have been too loud, go ahead and turn it down. We got ads coming up in three, two, one. Welcome back in Clips and Dip, episode 135 here. It's a playoff edition. I'm Adam Oslin. We got Crazy Bones Highland here with us, second tier Terrence. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not Adam Oslin. I'm the hypothetical hippo currently. Yep. <laughs> Get to us at Clippers Pod on Twitter at Clippers Podcast on YouTube, where you could be watching us right now. And we're going to be on Spectrum Monday morning on the television, Spectrum One. Okay, oh, yeah. So we actually got an email about that. They can only have two of us. We'll figure that out post-pod. <laughs> Let's argue about it right now. All right, anyway, Adam, go ahead. <laughs> uh, okay, so Paul George came out with a 15-minute podcast earlier previewing the Phoenix Suns series a little bit, and I did watch all of it. Of course. But earlier today, Coach Lou was asked about Paul George and his status and said, quote, we're definitely not going to do anything to hurt PG, even if he does try to come back. And if he's not right, then we're not going to let him go because we're not going to let him injure himself and make it worse than what it really is. So – Still no timetable, and Paul George even uh, spoke about this, and I pulled it and put it up on my Twitter account, at follow Adam A. But one of the things he said was, referring to the schedule and how brutal it is for the Clippers and how they always get F by the schedule, his words. He then said, looking for the silver lining, said, quote, let's effing take care of business. We'll get the most rest out of this. Get ready. Hopefully see where I'm at. Maybe I'm good. And yeah, we'll keep it going. <laughs> but that is tough for us. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense. La Murray said he's targeting that second round return if it's applicable. Like, yeah, I mean, I don't know. They're, they're not going to rush him out there. It's just not going to happen. Second round is a non starter for me. What do you mean? You wouldn't let him start? No, that's too. I, I just. We can't think know, about man. the second round? Yeah, I can't. I mean, a, I can't think about the second round. A, it's. I mean, it's insane that this series. I'm. I'm not saying it will be. I mean, unless it goes the Clippers' way, then it will be. Uh, it could be over in a week. I don't know if it'll be over in a week. You're gonna get swept because that would be a week. Yeah, Clippers. Clippers sweep. It's a week. <laughs> all right. Okay. Now I'm on board with the Clippers. They get a ton of rest. There. They get a ton of rest. PG comes back. No, I. 
it, man, it, that is like when, when we broke down that last episode and I the realized schedule. it was going to be a four and seven, um, man, that makes, you know, we, we were optimistic, maybe a couple of games in, we might be able to see him, you know, game three, game four. Uh, but with there only being a week between all those games, that's really difficult. And I, I mean, we'll have a much better indication, obviously, after games one and two. But man, the, I mean, the, the possibility or really what it sounds like right now, the probability of no Paul George for seven games. Um, I, I don't know that it's I don't know that it's insurmountable. But it um, it sounds pretty. It seems pretty damn close to it. I would put it in the not tight category. Yeah, <laughs> call BNT. me crazy. Not tight, not tight. That Paul George is now. I am still maybe a little bit irrationally hopeful based mm-hmm. upon what we heard earlier today. I would agree with that. Just by trying to read a poker face on Paul George and some of the faces he made on the show. I don't know. I, I'm hopeful midway through the series he could return somehow by game by game four. I still I, w- I still want to hold out hope. Like that would be what a week. So from he's tomorrow? gonna be back for the weekend game. He's gonna be back for the the twelve thirty game on Saturday. I didn't say he's gonna be back. I said I'm holding out <laughs> some hope. <laughs> All right, that's fair. I don't want to give false hope, but I have some hope that it could still happen because you just don't know how he's going to respond and where his body is going to be at. He did admit he was just doing a stationary shoot around. <laughs> Coaches were talking to him just- and trying to. Just you take did. him in the corner. Who cares? Just put him in the corner. Have him jog over there. Dead eye sharpshooter. It'll be like a it'll be like a hockey line shift for Paul George. He can only play offense and then just sub him out real quick on the defensive. It'll line. be the, what the I Kings mean, owner so, wanted with the <laughs> cherry picking. Oh God, yeah. Vivek. He went out on the twenty first, correct? Sure. Of March. Yeah, so, it's been around, it's been three plus weeks. That I mean, that that would put him at. A, about four and a put him at a month just yeah. before game four yeah which, with no get stay ready game or anything like that that we've heard to be fair i don't know uh, yeah whatever i i don't know how many like stay ready games uh paul george needs even if i mean like even if he's coming off the bench i think that that changes this series to the like the nth of degrees obviously um even if he's not at a hundred percent i think what a the threat of him out there on the floor scoring and what he can provide even at 70 percent on on the defensive end i think i i mean i think if if the clippers can hold out and not be down any more than two games coming into game four with a paul george return i i think they're I kind of think they're still sitting pretty. If they're down 2-1 heading into that game four, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that Paul George would give it a go. It's a 12-30 c- game, which is what gets me. Is if we had real rest, I would feel a little more comfortable about it. I just don't know if they're trotting PG out there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good point. I got the not tight label from Will on here, which I don't like, but that's fair. Um, all right. Predictions for game one with one specific thing the Clippers need to do in order to flip this home court advantage. Adam, what's your prediction for game one, and what is the one thing the Clippers need to do? Oh, not going with Paul George plays for the Suns. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go with the Clippers got to hit – 14 threes to win game one. Okay. And they have to continually outshoot them from the outside. And it starts in game one. And if you are knocking down threes, it's because it's a product of them running their offense, getting into the paint, creating havoc, and getting the jump on a Phoenix Suns team that just hasn't felt adversity yet before i think game one is the one to take i said before i think one game is going to be really close the clippers have to find a way to win i think another game in the first two games could be a blowout in favor of the phoenix suns where they just have a hot shooting night or put it all together for a little bit the clippers maybe go cold but game one i think more likely than not uh that's the one where the clippers seem to have more advantages uh even though they're down paul george will updike What's happening for the Clippers to win game one? 
I think the Clippers need to be able to ebb and flow tempos um, in, in a way that we maybe okay. haven't really seen. And I think that that's going to be one of those things that if Russ ends up being really effective offensively in this series, I, I think that that is going to be one of the things um, that – that it's because of is because they're able to speed things up. They're able to get this defense that doesn't have a whole lot of, of, of time together um, sort of on the move. And I think also, you know, like I talked about, I think that that could also mean if he's not working effective minutes of man and bones with Kawhi to sort of to, to bookend those stints, especially uh, when it's the bench plus KD and and um chris paul or, or whatever that ends up being i think if they can sort of grind things out when they're at full strength on the floor and then find ways to you know speed things up and uh get, get this sun's defense kind of reeling uh when they have some more scattershot pieces out there i think that that's going to prove really difficult i think if they can get a little unpredictable um, that, you know, that ups their chances. And I think that's what you have to do in when you're, when you're under man, like the Clippers, they got to find a way to turn this into a rock fight. <laughs> and yeah, I, 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 I think that like being able to ebb and flow in play styles, which granted we haven't necessarily seen a lot of, <laughs> we, you know, we've seen, you know, spurts. Um, I, I think that that could go a long ways. I, I really do. I really think that like being unpredictable uh, could make this team even undermanned very difficult to deal with. I'm going with Norm needs to score 20 plus for the Clippers in game one. Norm's got to score 20 plus. If he scores 20 plus, I think we're feeling pretty good. Um, yeah, there's God, there's so many damn things to think about for this series. What if they could just find a way? Because unlike the Golden State Warriors, and this is a super team, and I talked about it when they got Kevin Durant. And when the Clippers brought in Russell Westbrook, one of the things that I thought was a positive on the Clippers side for bringing him in is you kind of have to just acquire talent and figure it out when there's a team out there like the Phoenix Suns. You kind of have to just find more high-end talent where you can because if you run into the Suns, you might play your best and it doesn't matter because they have more talent. And if they're at their peak, they're going to end up beating you just like we saw with the Golden State Warriors a few years ago. And it's so huge that they do have Russ, especially with Paul George down. But the thing that's different between the Phoenix Suns and the Golden State Warriors and some of these other teams is while CP3 is not the head of the snake, he's not the best player on the team. He is the table setter. And – if you could just find a way to wreck them getting into their offense early by hounding and hassling yeah. CP3, that might just throw a wrench into their plans enough where guys aren't in as much of a rhythm. And they have been pretty good against him and have guys you can throw at him with Russ, with T-Man. I think Eric Gordon would be fine against him. There's a lot of different looks they could give Chris Paul that could just slow down their offense. Here's a lunatic idea that I just had going back to your guys' hippo that was too full or whatever you were talking too far out in the weeds with the hippo. Let's just stick Kawhi on Chris Paul the first three possessions. See what happens with that. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that will happen, but I'll tell you what, I don't think Chris Paul right now could get by Kawhi later. <laughs> I mean, my thing with that is just he's passing it out to a, a better offensive to a player. Booker who's being guarded by like Russ or something like he, that. He's yeah. passing it out to a better offensive player. So that I guess yeah. that would be my only counter for that. Okay. He hey, is. Just trying try to have some fun, guys. Sorry about but that. If, but if there's only eight seconds left on the shot clock because they got into their offense slowly, that changes things. That could wreck some of their plans. Powell's pal, Will got it right with this name. We're, we're doing great over here. Uh, <laughs> damn it. I got not fun or tight again. All right, we got to wrap this thing up and argue over who's going to go on Spectrum News later. Uh, we're going to have a double dip on Sunday, which is going to be a very fun time. We're going to have a preview pod on Monday for game two with Carl Tart, Grand Crew Zone. Shout out Carl Tart, friend of the show. Bought a John Wall jersey. Very funny. Uh, we're going to be on Spectrum 1 on Monday morning, some combination of us. Truly no idea who. Uh, and yeah, please give us some reviews over on Spotify, Deezer. Check us out on YouTube. Um, subscribe at Clippers Podcast. It's a fun time. Um, anything else you fellas want to say to the Clipper faithful as we head into the unknown that is the NBA playoffs? Let's go. Uh, don't cut off my head because I'm not the head of the snake. There we go. Bones and man, bones and man forever. 
out. Both the man forever out. Let's go, Clips. Don't cut my head off. All right. We will be back <laughs> with the full. We'll have a quad pod for you on Monday. We'll be talking to you Sunday, too. Might do a full episode. We don't know. But uh, yeah, leave us those reviews. And as Will said, let's go, Clips. <laughs>